Good afternoon, and let me welcome all of you to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and let me also welcome our viewers online. And thank you for joining us today for our discussion, Park, Xi, the Post-Summit Assessment. This event is part of the CSIS Korea Platform Series, and as always, we'd like to thank Samsung Electronics, whose generous support make these events possible. My name is Ryan Sickles, and I'm the Deputy Director of External Relations here at CSIS. And I'm privileged to be joined today by two of my colleagues and longtime Asia hands, Victor Cha and Chris Johnson. They're here to discuss the geopolitical ramifications, the regional jockeying, and the bilateral implications of the very important meeting between Chinese President Xi Jinping and Republic of Korea President Park Geun-hye that occurred last week in Seoul. We couldn't have two more qualified experts to discuss the summit. You all have their bios in front of you, but allow me to quickly introduce our two speakers. Dr. Victor Cha, CSIS Senior Advisor and Korea Chair, as well as Director of Asian Studies at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Previously, he served as, Asian, as Director of Asian Affairs at the White House National Security Council and was Deputy Head of the U.S. Delegation to the Six-Party Talks in Beijing. He regularly testifies before Congress on Asian security issues, and his writings often appear in major media outlets around the world. Chris Johnson is also CSIS Senior Advisor and holds our Freeman Chair in China Studies. Prior to joining CSIS, Chris spent nearly two decades in the U.S. intelligence and foreign affairs communities, including his most recent post as a top China analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency. He's briefed top officials throughout government, and his analysis is highly sought after by the world's media. These gentlemen will each open with their own reflections and analysis of the summit before opening to a discussion with all of you. So without further ado, let me turn this over to Chris to get us started. Please join me in welcoming our two speakers. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan, and uh, thank everyone for, uh, for being here. Um, it definitely was uh, an interesting piece of theater to watch, I think, uh, uh, this summit that's just occurred. And, and has a lot of implications, I think, for how, from the Chinese perspective, and I'm sure Victor feels the same from the South Korean perspective, uh, it's a great emblematic story, I think, of the dramatic tectonic shifts that we're seeing in the region uh, in terms of how the region is shifting with China's growing rise and influence, and how that puts all the more pressure, especially on the United States government, but also regional governments to kind of be aware of these changes and to try to stay one step ahead of them or at least uh, manage them successfully. Um, you know, my key takeaways from the summit were, one, that uh, Xi Jinping clearly continues his uh, sort of courting process, if you will, of uh, President Pak, uh, very much desirous of establishing a totally different uh, and much warmer relationship with Seoul uh, after the uh, Lee Mung Bak administration, where of course things were very strained between uh, the Chinese and South Korea, largely because of China's uh, support for North Korea, despite um, silly behavior from the North Koreans, and dangerous behavior by the North Koreans. Uh, clearly, Xi Jinping has made this a priority from early in his administration when he hosted President Park. When she came and visited, uh, there clearly is a good rapport between the two of them. Uh, it's interesting to me, just watching the, the sort of personal dynamics between the two of them, uh, President Park is probably one of the few leaders internationally around whom Xi Jinping seems almost deferential and somewhat nervous. Uh, this is pretty unusual for him. Uh, and so I think that's a, a real interesting development. Uh, it may give, uh, it may give President Park some uh, leverage <laughs> in the relationship. Uh, but it, it's, it's unique. And I think, you know, part of this is the Chinese understand, you know, she, she speaks Mandarin. I think she was very thoughtful in the, in the visit that she made to China about making sure to go not just to Beijing, but also out to Xi'an to show her interest in Chinese culture, you know, and so on. Uh, so there's a lot going on. I think at the same time, none of us should be too surprised that, that the kind of underlying goal here for China is to see what progress can be made in terms of pulling the South Koreans more into 
China's orbit in terms of how they think about policy developments. Uh, they see, I think, South Korea as on the chessboard, uh, something where they can perhaps have a better influence. I think the Chinese are very rational in their understanding of the power of the alliance with the United States and the trilateral alliance with Japan. But that doesn't mean they're not going to seek opportunities through the pull of their economic relationship with South Korea and, let's face it, some pretty serious uh, present tensions with Japan uh, to see what they can do. I think what's interesting, though, about Xi Jinping's approach in several of these instances, and, and these days, as many of you who attend my China events will know, when we talk about the Chinese government, we increasingly talk about Xi Jinping, because uh, this is the way he sort of uh, accreted all of this power to himself personally and is exercising foreign policy often based on his own views on things. And what's been interesting to see is, despite this desire to try to ingratiate himself with South Korea and to uh, bring the South Koreans more closely into the orbit of China, there are always in each one of these visits or interactions that little bit of punch that comes with the, uh, that comes with the softer side that, if I'm South Korea, leaves me kind of wondering, you know, what indeed is, is going on here. And I think it's very reflective of what we're seeing in other places in the region where the Chinese are indeed trying to have good relations with their neighbors, promote good relations with their neighbors, but also trying to transmit the idea that increasingly we're going to call the shots in the neighborhood. And we want a good relationship with you, um, but it's on our terms. And we want you to be uh, willing to accept that. And so I think in just a couple of the instances that we saw where Xi Jinping's speech, for example, at Seoul National University talked a lot about the Japan issue and history issue, tried to rope the South Koreans probably uncomfortably for them into implicit criticism of Japan. Uh, and, you know, I, I think we see this time and again with, with Xi's approach. Uh, the other thing I think to emphasize that was noteworthy for me uh, was the large business delegation, of course, that, uh, that Xi Jinping brought along with him, uh, heads of all of the major Chinese tech companies uh, and so on. And a lot of people are busy sweating that, you know, this me, and of course he went and he toured um, the Samsung uh, industrial facility, was given a personal tour by the heir apparent of the company, you know, and so on. So obviously there's a lot uh, of symbolism in there about the business to business relationship. And I think the, the, that delegation that the Chinese brought may have bred some concern about cooperation deepening between those two uh, sides. But let's remember that Samsung and LG are competitors with all those companies that were coming over from the Chinese side and so on. So I think that's also very important for us to remember uh, that there are, it's a competitive relationship as much as it's a cooperative one. Yes, the South Koreans very much understand um, what's going on uh, with the economic pull and power of China, but I think they also, like so many other countries in the region now, after uh, some of China's recent behavior, they welcome that interaction, but they're also somewhat cautious, you know, uh, wanting to know what China wants out of that process and, and are the strings that might be attached uh, more than they want to subscribe to. Uh, I think also on the North Korea issue, obviously there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of discussion. I think in the past, you know, in the first summit, there was this impression that uh, the Chinese were perhaps having some success in painting themselves as an alternative answer, if you will, to uh, South Korea's North Korea problem. Um, I think that narrative is much harder to establish now given China's uh, seriously strained relations with the North. So their ability to kind of get the North to behave or to influence, that has declined. But I, it strikes me that now the tack from both China and South Korea, I think if they're playing this smartly, is to just emphasize the strength of the bilateral relationship. I mean, you know, yes, a lot of commentary was put out there about how this is the first time a Chinese leader went to South Korea before he went to North Korea. And that's obviously true as a statement of fact. Uh, I don't want to oversell it, but I do think it says a lot about how they're thinking about the relationship. And there always has been this balancing act. And it really was one of the few times that I'm aware of that they didn't even have a senior North Korean official kind of drop in and have that exchange before he went uh, to the South. So clearly, uh, in terms of uh, an advantage for the South Korean government, but also China's messaging to North Korea. There was a lot of uh, in implicit messaging there. I think what's encouraging is uh, to see is that, you know, uh, coming out of the uh, CICA or Kika or however you pronounce it, summit in Shanghai, uh, where there was this effort to talk a lot about new security concept and so on, and the South Koreans clearly 
balked at that uh, the first time around. I would imagine Xi Jinping pressed this very heavily again uh, in this instance, and I think from what we can see from the joint statement and so on, uh, it, uh, it didn't gain any traction again. So folks who are worried that somehow the South Koreans are going to abandon the alliance or something like this, I don't think there's uh, too much to be concerned with there. Likewise, I think the, the history issue with Japan, obviously the Chinese can get a lot of mileage uh, out of this and want to want to uh, press that as hard as they can, but I do think the, the Seoul government is very mindful right now of how they message that and, and that it's a double-edged sword for them, just like it is in some ways for the Chinese with regard to public reaction and, and expectations and so on. So that's my quick overview. I'm happy to elaborate some more, but uh, Great. Okay. <laughs> why don't you jump in? All right, um, so I agree with everything Chris said, so maybe we should just go to questions. So. Um, don't do that. <laughs> Um, well, thank Chris. First of all, thanks for you know we decided to put no, this thing this together pretty quickly, and um, um, thanks for joining us because I know that you are really busy and on planes most of the time. <laughs> um, and I look around the room, and I think I thought most of you were on vacation. So <laughs> thank you for joining us as well. The so let me just sort of make um, three quick points. Uh, and I think you'll find a lot of them resonate with um, stuff that Chris has already said. Um, the first thing is sort of when you think about summits like this, um, as a former staffer, I can tell you there's sort of three things you think about. Um, the first is sort of just the, the, the logistics, everything that goes into a summit, which is the logistics, the, form, the negotiation of commas and semicolons and everything in the formal statements, there's that aspect of it, right? So the logistics and the language. Um, the second are the optics, very important. You know, how this thing looks. I mean, the two leaders are meeting. That's what sort of impression that's giving. And the third is sort of the substantive policy messaging, right? That, that's the third piece of it. So let me take you through each piece and at least give you my opinion on this. Um, so first, in terms of optics, very clear, you know, optics were fantastic, right? As um, as Chris said, these two leaders um, do have a relationship with sorts. It's been their fifth, I think, fifth meeting yeah. um, between the two of them. Um, um, with you know, no meetings between the Chinese leader and the North Korean, but the fifth meeting between the two, the second summit. Um, I think Chris is right. I mean, President Xi seems a little bit uncomfortable around Park Geun-hye, almost like he's got a crush on her. <laughs> like he's, really, you know, he's just very... Um, he said is, that, not me. Right, right, very <laughs> uncharacteristic. Um, um, and, uh, um, and so, and I think, and at least from the South Korean perspective, I think the bottom line is the South Koreans have wanted for a long time to have a leader that they can have a relationship with in China, mm. right? I think. It has been the aspiration of previous South Korean leaders unsuccessfully, and so I think they really feel like um, this is the one that they have a, uh, they have a good relationship with. Um, in terms of the language, right, this, the, the second, I mean, the logistics were fine. Um, uh, in terms of the language, the formal statements, I think, really highlighted two things. One is sort of the deepening strategic relationship between South Korea and China. Um, whether it's in the form of a creation in recent years of a whole set of bilateral consultations at all sorts of different levels across all ministries um, um, to really uh, you know, broaden and deepen the relationship. And then the second message, I think, was uh, as evidenced by the large business delegation and the proclamation is the economic relationship, and in particular, setting a very high bar for economic cooperation, particularly with this announcement of the ambition to conclude the uh, bilateral FTA by the end of the calendar year. So mm -hmm. um, not only talking about how, um, how strong the economic relationship already is, but really setting an even higher bar of trying to take it even further and faster. Um, uh, and then the third is on sort of the substantive policy messaging. And I think, so I, this is just my personal opinion, I think there's sort of three things that I saw here um, the first is that the, the substantive policy messaging on the alliance with the United States. And I think very clearly the Koreans wanted to be able to show that um, they can have this sort of deep and strong relationship with China at, in the context of a very deep and very strong foundation 
uh, of a relationship with the United States. Right? Um, and you know, I think if it were the South Korean choice, they would always like to have um, a, a China summit following a U.S.-South Korea summit, just because it, it helps to reinforce that message. I think many senior policymakers in South Korea see the, the, two, the relationship between the two as, as, as positive sum in the sense that um, a strong U.S. ROK relationship actually gives uh, the South Koreans a better foundation upon which to build a relationship with China, mm. um, and that if their relations with the United States are not good, then actually that hurts their mm -hmm. ability to have a good relationship with China, or at least a relationship from their perspective where they feel like they're on more of an equal footing. So, uh, so I think that was sort of one of the messages that they wanted to send. The other, um, um, and this is a bit more complex, was I think they also wanted to try to send a message that, uh, that, the US, that the bilateral relationship between China and the ROK is about China and the ROK, and that it's not about Japan. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's you know, a natural perception, given the difficulties in the relationship between Seoul and Tokyo, for many to see this as a, a sort of reaction to the relationship with Japan. Undeniably, the, the Chinese want to leverage this for that purpose, and there are a number of things that we can talk about in the summit that clearly were, uh, were, were aimed at doing that. Um, but um, I think from the South Korean perspective, what they try, the way they tried to um, show this was first, you know, in the formal language of the statement, there was no mention of Japan, mm -hmm. right? Um, um, and, uh, and there was no acceptance of this idea of a joint 70-year celebration, this sort of stuff. I mean, the, um, it's pretty clear that what the South Koreans are trying to do is, without denying that they have some deep and substantive issues with Japan, to try to very clearly delink that mm. from their relationship with China and talk about their history problem with Japan as a, as a sovereign issue, something that they deal with uh, on their own terms with, with, um, with Japan, and that um, while they will listen to and may even quietly empathize with some of the things that the Chinese say, they're not willing to draw that formal link. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the third message, and, I, and, and it's sort of related to second, is that the China ROK relationship is not about Japan, but it is about North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, and very clearly, the um, you know, the Chinese, I mean, the, the South Koreans, I think, sense not incorrectly that there's a distance between Beijing and Pyongyang um, that has not been there before. In part, it has to do with the leadership change in both countries, you know, North Korean actions, a variety of things. But I think the bottom line is that whether correctly or incorrectly, we just don't know, they sense space there. Mm -hmm. And so that, I think, is what is motivating a lot of this um, effort to deepen the strategic tie with China, it's really to try to move the needle on North Korea with China. Now, we all know that there's a clear core dilemma here, which is that the, the South Koreans need the Chinese when they think about unification, but at the same time they know the Chinese don't want North Korea to collapse. Um, in spite of that dilemma, they still work the problem, and I think that's exactly what they're, they're, uh, they're trying to do now. Um, and, um, you know, and so what is it that they're trying to do? I mean, I think probably the most important conversations that may have taken place between the two leaders we'll never know about. <laughs> um, uh, and, the, and, um, um, uh, but I think what the South Koreans hope for is to try to get a deeper understanding on China's part that essentially China's future on the Korean Peninsula is with the South. Mm. It's, not with, it's not with the North, and you can point to the business delegations, you can point to the FTA, you can point to a variety of things um, that is evidence of that. Um, in terms of the road ahead, uh, three quick things. First, um, the, this, uh, the bilateral FTA commitment to try to finish this by the end of the year, in my view, very lofty goal. There's a lot of work, at least from my understanding, that needs to be done in terms of market access and other, just lots of stuff that needs to be done. Um, the, what this suggests to me is that if they do reach an agreement, it's not gonna be a high quality FTA. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was, maybe it was Chris or somebody else said that, you know, these FTAs in many ways are political agreements yeah. more than anything else. And, 
And so I think that appears to be the track that if, if the idea is to finish by the end of the year, that appears to be the track that the China ROK FDA is on. I think from Korea's perspective, they don't have a problem with that and they don't see that as being inconsistent with uh, what is now a much more clearly enunciated interest in TPP and being one of the first, uh, you know, if, if whenever agreement happens, one of, be one of the first <laughs> countries, po major economies post agreement to accede to, uh, to TPP. Um, the second is um, the whole issue of transparency. And I think while this was a great summit, you know, I think the Koreans walk away from it still with these very lingering concerns about, in, that, that, you know, there's still some basic transparency issues when it comes to dealing with China. And one of the clearest examples of this was this speech that he gave, that President Xi gave at Seoul National University, where my understanding is, you know, so we all know what this was in the speech, right? It was a very forward-leaning view on history and Japan and countries in Asia that have been, you know, that are tied together and been whipped by Japan together and all this. Um, but, you know, from I think, and I don't know if any Korean official will say this, but I think from the Korean perspective, it was quite awkward and uncomfortable, but also that they didn't know, right? They didn't know what was coming in the speech, largely because it wasn't shared in advance. And so, you know, that's got to leave um, some uh, lingering, you know, questions about the, the transparency relation. And then the, the last thing I'll say, and this is um, sort of where Chris closed, so I'll close at the same place. There's sort of a dual game going on here because the Chinese walk away from this summit and their feeling is like, we got the South Koreans right where we want them, right? <laughs> We're starting to peel them off slowly from the, we got them right where they want them. And the Koreans walk away from the summit and they're like, we got the Chinese right where we want them. <laughs> you know, they're starting to edge away from North Korea. So it's, it's uh, you know, they, there's kind of, there's this, sort of this dual game going on. And uh, in the end, it's probably a wash. Right? Well, actually, so, if I can just build on yeah. that, because I think it is a very important point that, that leads to a couple of others. I, I actually think my sense would be that both President Park and President Xi know exactly that that's what's going on, mm -hmm. and they like it. Yeah. You know, they're they're yeah. that kind of personality, the two of them. You yeah. know, it's sort of who's going to use the other one more. You right. know, right. Uh, this is clearly Xi Jinping's relationship with Putin, right? Yeah. You know, you see a lot of this going on, and 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 they both acknowledge that that's the game, mm -hmm. and it's the blood sport of politics. I mean, I don't know if it's the uh, princeling phenomenon or <laughs> you know yeah. how yeah. that works, but there seems to be a kind of enjoyment of uh, the bloodlust of competition. Yeah. you know uh, which is which is interesting um, and I think that speaks more broadly to a couple of factors with Xi Jinping just to because your points about the alliance I think were very important mm -hmm. and and one of the one of his goals I think in this process is to again signal not that they think they're going to somehow have a big win you know with regard to pulling the South Koreans off militarily but again to just kind of signal the US side we have options we have options. We can do this stuff bilaterally if we need to. The free trade agreement is a bit of a smack at a TPP yep. process, I think, to yep. some degree. I agree with you. It'll be very political. Uh, I guess, you know, I'd welcome your views. I have some questions as to, you know, I mean, certainly Southeast Asians and their free trade agreement with the Chinese, after, you know, where they did sign a very political agreement, have subsequently sort of said, whoa, we would have renegotiated certain parts of that if mm -hmm. we'd known this is how it was going to go. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if this, presumably the South is aware of that phenomenon and, and kind of, I wonder, in other words, how far are they willing to go, you know, yeah. just to have the agreement. Yeah. And then I think the other piece is, again, this, this uh, stuff we've been talking about in the paper you and I collaborated on, um, this kind of great power diplomacy piece, right, and, and how the Chinese are trying to just say straight out now, we're going to be much more active diplomatically, and that includes getting away from the constraints of the whole North Korea lips and teeth thing. We're going to do what is in our sort of great power, uh, Morgenthau realist <laughs> you know, uh, uh, interest. And, and also through this subtle, you know, uh, you know, smile but kick element, uh, you know, not giving them the text of the speech and so on, this, this kind of, we're the big gun, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, yeah. and the rest of you are are here to understand that. You know, that kind of element I think is very powerful. And, and so while it suggests some 
it's it, it, again certainly not to compare the two, but it is interesting. There's some parallels with the Russia relationship. We all know that there are hard limits with regard to how much progress China might be able to make in that relationship. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't focus very carefully on what's going on there, right? Mm -hmm. And and be very aware of it. And it doesn't mean we have to go crazy responding. It just means we have to also elevate our game a little bit to stay informed and and so on. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I. Um Right. I mean, the, the fact that there is, I mean, that I, I do, I think, and I think many analysts in town believe that there are limits to how far the South Korea-China relationship can go. That is not a mandate for apathy right? <laughs> right, right, and right. ambivalence on the U.S. side. I mean, it clearly means um, we have to keep our game up uh, mm -hmm. at the same time. On the FTA, I think, yeah, it's interesting because I think um, from my understanding of, of the whole process, you know, they are really in the hard part of mm -hmm. an FTA negotiation now, and yeah. it is it is ugly, ugly, and <laughs> difficult. And um, yeah, how much the you know, given that the Koreans have negotiated the pro the, the prototypical high quality FTA in Chorus, mm -hmm. which was the framework for TPP, which right. was the framework for India and EU, yeah. mm. you know, how much are they willing to compromise? Yeah, exactly. I think um, it, it sends a bad political signal to mm -hmm. compromise too much. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think. There's some deep, dark desire on the part of the Koreans also to try to be the bridge, mm. eventually, Interesting. Um, for mm. uh, you know, for eventually China being integrated into this broader yeah. trade architecture. That's now that's, I mean, I shouldn't say a deep dark sea. That's more of a like a, um, a dream, sure. right? Oh, that makes sense. Um, but uh, and and so that will also figure into how much they should or shouldn't mm -hmm. compromise in terms of what this FTA looks like. I mean, it, it is puzzling to me why they set out such a clear timeline. Yeah, yeah. yeah that um, is interesting. Because it does put a lot of pressure, pressure on both systems. On both systems. Yeah. And the other bureaucratic issue on the Korean side is all the uh, Korea watchers in the room know, you know there was a, a reorganization of who does trade negotiations on the Korean side. Now, the trade ministry used to be a part of the foreign ministry. Used mm -hmm. to, it used, that's why we had had this terrible acronym, MOFAT, right? <laughs> ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And now the trade ministry is, is not within the foreign ministry, which means it's tr no offense to anybody in the room, but it's a trade bureaucrat who's doing the negotiation, not someone who is also thinking about the grand strategy. Right, so someone who might be more focused on widgets or, yeah. Right, um, right. Um, yeah. And, and, and not thinking about the broader political implications. Interesting. It just strikes me that, you know, the, the, that whole ICT space especially is so important to mm -hmm. the Korean economy, and yet that's the area where it's going to be toughest, right, trying mm -hmm. to come to, to closure and so on. And yeah. Uh, yeah. so interesting for sure. Yeah. Something to keep an eye on. Yeah. I think we'll open up to questions. Um, if you could identify yourself, wait for a microphone, um, and keep your question in the form of a question, that would be <laughs> ideal. It's just like Jeopardy. We've got a couple down here. Let's start here, and then we'll come over to Chris. Nope, it's over here. Yeah. Thanks very much. Rob Warren, I'd like to ask you about South Korea's trust politic towards North Korea. What we have, I think, is a real spanner in the works. They really haven't addressed North Korea adequately. Is there an opportunity that the two could try to deepen a dialogue with North Korea? Would trust politic be the basis for further progress? Yeah. Um, thanks, Rob. You know, I think, um, so my understanding of trust politic, the concept of it is uh, essentially they're, they're, so the concept of it is you can't, you, you know, any sort of relationship has to be built on trust, right? And how do you get trust? It first starts with um, small promises, right? Small promises turned into, into practices, and practices eventually turn into institutions. I think that's sort of, you know, in a nutshell, that's sort of the conceptual thing behind it. I think as a strategically or tactically, however you look at it, um, it also um, gives uh, Park the moral high ground, mm. right, in being able to say, look, I'm interested in principle in a relationship, but it has to be tra based on trust. You know, how could anybody disagree with that, right? I mean, it's like, you it's like saying, do you disagree with, you know, apple pie as being American? You just can't disagree with that. So I think you, have to, you can call that tactics or strategically, I think that was one of the ideas behind it. Um, but as we can see, not very successful, right? I mean, 
one family reunion, closing and then reopening of Kaesong, but really nothing, nothing beyond that. And, um, and I get the sense that trust politics is still a part of the policy, but that in the beginning of the second year of the Park Geun-hye administration, especially with the Dresden speech, it, the discussion has moved much more in the direction of unification now. Um, and also, in terms of inter-Korean relations, a focus on the people of North Korea and trying to help connect with the people of North Korea. Um, that's, again, something that I think most people can't disagree with, but the latter probably is seen as quite threatening to, to the regime. So, um, so right now, the prospects don't look very good. Uh, we've passed uh, June 15th, right, which is the anniversary what, the 14-year anniversary of the summit, the first summit, and nothing really came there. People thought maybe something was going to happen there. Um, the closer we get to August, the more people think we're going to cycle back to something worse because exercises start again, military exercises start again in the region. So, you know, is it, there's this window here that, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for something to happen, but it doesn't, doesn't look like it right now. Um, having said that, it's north-south, right? So it's very unpredictable, <laughs> right? Anything can happen. Uh, but right now, the, 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 uh, it, it doesn't look very good. No. Yeah, Chris. Got one coming right here. Right here. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Uh, Chris Nelson, also reports. Sorry, it's a couple minutes late. I had to push send, you know. Um, a journalist friend. Uh, that you guys know, uh, called me today and said, did I have a sense that uh, President Park is more interested in uh, being tougher with the, the North Koreans on nuclear issues to get more involved in it? And I said, boy, well, yeah, maybe, but you better call Victor. So maybe she did. I hope she did. Uh, what's your, what would have been your answer if she did call uh, uh, without letting cats out of the bag? Uh, is there a sense that President Park is perhaps more into dealing with uh, the, the larger strategic issue of, of nukes and, uh, and missiles and not just the North-South issues? And because that also feeds into the relationship with China and the clear mutual self-interest that both China and South Korea have in the people development, economic development program. Uh, I just, one small anecdote. I, I was up in New York with one of these track twos recently. I don't, can't remember if you were there, Victor, but a senior Chinese that we both know said that what they're working towards is trying to force the North Koreans to, uh, to choose more butter and less guns. Uh, my phrase for it, but, but that's really what he was talking about. And his senior American participant said, well, they've already chosen, uh, I wish, you know, but they're, they're choosing the guns. So it, I, I think that's vaguely related uh, uh, and is, is a question. Uh, what, what do you think happened, uh, if anything, between Park and Xi on dealing with, with North Korea? Is nukes, are nukes more on the agenda? Is there any possibility of more cooperation on the, on the economic development, social development aspect in North Korea. Thanks. All right, well, I'll offer some thought, and then I'll, you know, Chris, maybe you want to talk about sort of the China and how China saw it. But so, so you, know, I, you know, I think basically, um, I mean, many people in this room have been following this issue for a long time, right? And I think we're, you know, essentially there, Sure, there could be another negotiation. And sure, I'm sure the Chinese and the South Koreans talked about how do we get back to a six-party talks? How do we get a freeze back in place? How do we get inspectors back in place? How do we do all these sorts of things? So I think that conversation is a part of any discussion. You know, when you get to that part of the talking points on, on, the, on, on North Korea. But I think it is, it's all happening increasingly more it's all, that sort of discussion is increasingly happening in either a spoken or unspoken context of that we all understand that's just a tactical uh -huh. way station uh -huh. and that there's a larger game here um, and that the answer ultimately to the threat of North Korean nuclear weapons in the region has, uh, has much more to do with the overall future of the Korean Peninsula uh -huh. than it does some tactical negotiation. And so who knows whether that was a spoken or an unspoken context, but I think that is increasingly the context in which these 
discussions take place. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, I, and I, I guess I would put in a vote for unspoken. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and that the formal dance of it is, is as you say, the kind of list. Um, one thing that did strike me, I think the best cueing to look at from the Chinese side on, on this issue was how much attention it got in their central media. Mm -hmm. And there were distinctive People's Daily and Xinhua releases related solely to the denuclearization issue. Uh -huh. So I think that does suggest that at least messaging wise, they wanted to indicate that you know this was on the table, front and center and so on. And again, I think this is another one of these issues where there's a subtle jab at the US here too, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, the Chinese of course have been trying to suggest, I think to the US side, that we're more willing now to discuss you know, um, some of these issues that perhaps maybe in the past we might not have been. Mm -hmm. And so why not take advantage of a summit with South Korea to be able to say, they, they're open to the idea of talking to us in this more robust fashion, you mm -hmm. know, uh, mm -hmm. about these issues. Uh, we'd like to see that from you, the United States. I think that maybe there was some subtle messaging in there mm -hmm. uh, along those lines. And then I also think it's just the broader issue of, you know, this whole conundrum of how to understand China's policy toward the North, and is it indeed changing, and, 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 and all of this. And, you know, I think you, I mean, my position is that there's a lot of ink and other, and air and everything else wasted on whether or not the policy has changed, uh, because that's an angel's dancing on the head of a pin issue. You know, the, the core uh, approach of China has not changed fundamentally. I mean, they're still giving them, you know, the, the, the life support that they need. Where I do think it has changed in the, is in this area of redefining the relationship with the North, you know, right? To both A, give them more perhaps strategic flexibility with the South, but also again this idea of, you know, normalizing the relationship with the North to the degree Xi Jinping has made any effort to change. I think that's what it is. And it's not, it's not to open that relationship. It's rather to sort of say, again, we're the patron, you're the client. You need to behave like the client. The lips and teeth thing where we will put up with your petulant child behavior is, is gone, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we want you to get in line. And of course, North Korea, from my perspective, you'd know better, is pushing back very hard against that, that, that message, right? And trying to say, no, no, we're our own, our own show. So that is straining things, you know, uh, incredibly badly. And then I think also just, you know, from my recent trips, I, I do pick up a, a, a heavier sense of, I won't go so far as to say fear, but, but certainly insecurity in the Chinese leadership about what the heck is going on inside mm -hmm. North Korea. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I think this is one of those areas where oftentimes we need to just, uh, you know, when the Chinese tell us something, we need to just believe it, at, take it at face value. And when they say they don't know what's going on or their, their capability is diminished, we should listen to them, mm -hmm. you know, on, on that one, I think. So, so there, therefore, a desire also just to get another altitude you know, uh, amplitude uh, take from mm -hmm. another very deeply concerned party. I think yeah. that would have been part of Xi's agenda. Interesting, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's go right here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Donna Wells. I'm a geopolitical analyst. Can you talk about the India-China-Korea strategic triangle under Modi? If you saw that one. <laughs> the India, I'm sorry. India, China, India, China uh, Korea, India, Korea strategic India, triangle. Japan. Right, uh -huh. right. Okay. Now with Modi and. Yeah. I, I can take a whack go, Yeah, while no, you go think. Ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> don't everybody jump Try to once. help each other. Uh, well, I, 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 won't, I, I don't know much about the South Korea piece, so I, 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 I don't want to speak out of ignorance there. I, I, what has been interesting to me uh, since uh, Prime Minister Modi's election has been the speed with which the Chinese have tried to embrace him, you know, which I think is very interesting. Uh, knowing full well his past views on uh, China and the relationship with, with China. Uh, some of this, I think, is being driven by their concerns, as you point out, about the relationship with Abe uh, and how that's developing and how they might slow that process. Uh, some of it, I think, is developing out of a concern that, uh, you know, we're pretty darn busy on our front door right now, you know, with the maritime stuff. So we need to secure the back door and, and at least keep things calm, you know. Uh, that's a big piece of this as well. I think they also want to use thing, vehicles like the BRICS Bank, you know, and, and these sort of ideas to signal to the Indians we're about trade and economics and growth and our relationship with you. We'll put the security stuff aside. I mean, you know, I think it was quite interesting that, that Wang Yi, the foreign minister, when he visited uh, India, you know, 
made noises that they're willing to move towards solving the border dispute. And you know, and this is one of those where I'll believe it when I see it. But you know, the same calculus that went on for the Chinese with regard to solving the land border issue with Russia may be sort of at play uh, with the Indians and all part of this desire to kind of keep, you know, because. Unfortunately, I think that the Chinese may be more more willing, more likely to believe in the kind of pincer movement concept, even though I would argue, especially from the Indian perspective, there's no interest at all in, in New Delhi in, in playing that role. You know, uh, They're all about the, the economic relationship and so on. So I think this is another one of these areas where there are these kind of tectonic shifts going on, and there's a lot of space, and everybody's trying to jump into the space, right? And we'll just have to see how it develops. I, I don't know how the South Koreans play in this, but uh, maybe you yeah, have a view. Yeah, I don't, I actually don't either. Um, the, um, I mean, yes, the leadership change is quite significant. How much that has impacted Korea's initiatives on India, I don't think that much. I mean, there's always been a constant interest for trade reasons, for a variety of other reasons. Um, you know, the, the large play in that part of the world for India has always been Japan, mm. and, um, but not, not so much Korea. I mean, I could be wrong. There might be some initiative out there that I don't know about, but, um, but I think it's really, the, it's really that three-way relationship that mm -hmm. is most impacted by the change in India. I think so, too. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go over here on the aisle and then down here. Uh, Steve Winters, Washington-based researcher. I'd like to get back to your comments about uh, Xi's uh, speech at the National University. Uh, somehow, the impression you're giving is that uh, he sort of went on a, off on a tangent of his own without informing them. But uh, from what I've seen, for example, from CCTV, uh, they do, the Chinese and the South Koreans do seem to be making common cause on this issue of history. For example, the commission they've set up to collect records regarding the comfort women that still exist in the mainland and sort, sort, sort through those. Uh, and particularly, I, uh, there was a recent uh, meeting of, uh, of uh, Korean elite uh, speakers over at the Wilson Center, and they uh, express a lot of concern about Abe's reinterpretation of the Constitution and so forth and so on. So if you see that, sort of put those two things together, I mean, it seems that Xi's speech is really sort of a response to the uh, reinterpretation of the Constitution, and that really they are making common cause in saying, no, we're not going to, as their slogans go, we're not going to uh, uh, let the uh, defeat of fascism be reversed uh, or what happened be denied and so forth and so on. So I don't quite see why you're trying to separate the two. Just before you yeah. go deep, I'll just have a one sentence answer, yeah. which is I think you, in some ways you answered your own question because you watched, you saw it on CCTV. So, you know, that should, that should kind of <laughs> tell you, you know, that there might be some shaping going on. But. Um, so, um, so, so my understanding of the whole Seoul National University thing was that, you know, the Koreans invited him to give a public speech. He was happy to do it. They said, great. Can we see the speech? And they said, no, maybe later. <laughs> Got closer to the event. Can we see the speech now? No, right? Um, uh, and so basically they, and, and they weren't going to pull the plug because that would have created more problems than not pulling the plug. And, but once, once the speech started, it was very clear what the purpose of the speech was and what the message was. Now, with, with something like this, can you find elements where you can point to and say, yeah, the Koreans and Chinese look like they have common cause on this. Absolutely, right? I mean, just, you know, any place you can find that. At the level, of, at the official level, you know, as an analyst, I look for certain things. And one of the things I look for, is there anything in the formal statement, mm -hmm. right? Because that would be a, a serious indication of common cause. Um, 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 is, is there, you know, is there, are there any sort of formal agreements at the official level Right? And this commission, you know, maybe, I think basically the way that the Koreans tried to handle this was that they, you know, they knew that it was the elephant in the room if you didn't talk about it being a part of the discussion at all. And so the way they tried to split the difference was essentially to uh, insist that it not be a part of any formal part of the communication, but then there'd be a back brief afterwards that the Blue House gave in which they said, yeah, of course, they talked about this, this sort of issue. And, and that's, I think, the way, you know, again, if part of summits are messaging, that's so, sort of the way they get the message out. But at the same time, 
not give the impression that they are allying with the Chinese you know, ag against China. I mean, I'd welcome your thoughts, but a question I would have based on what you described with regard to the speech is, you know, then what happened afterward? Did they do a demarche? Did they, you know, Yeah, it's uh, an somehow, interesting question. I don't know, you, you know, know they're, express their... They're probably, probably embassy officials in the room from both countries, so maybe we can ask them, <laughs> you know, what was the, uh, what was the uh, aftermath of the, of the Seoul National speech? Down here. Hi, uh, thank you, Chen Weihua. Yeah, I'm not surprised you say. I mean, um, President Xi looked like they have a crush on President Park because uh, <laughs> President Park, I think, is a massively popular among the Chinese. I don't. I actually, do, I only heard nice words about her. That's unusual. I mean, for any world leader, I mean, I mean coming among the Chinese, uh, millions of netizens probably. I mean, the question I have is. Uh, uh, you know, this uh, tricky relationship about China and South Korea have with Japan. I mean, there's no bilateral summit uh, with Japan. So to what extent, do you, what kind of a compromise maybe Japan or anyone would make to, for this kind of a summit to happen? Will China, maybe South Korea, coordinate on such things? I mean, who will do first? Mm -hmm. And second question, I think, uh, I hope it's not distraction. I think it's, uh, you mentioned China-South Korea relation is also subject to, I mean, the nature of China-US relationship. So Chris, I mean, based on your interpretation on the first day of SED, I mean, Beijing, mm -hmm. do you think this relationship China-US uh, is warming up I mean, leading up, of course, to November's uh, visit by President Obama. Thank you. Sure. I'd the love to hear your point. views on SCD. So okay, go ahead. Well, you I'll, go first, I'll do so. that. But I, I think it's uh, important, though, to, uh, to also address the first half of the question, because, you know, I, I do think there's an, an element there that's, that's worthwhile. And, I, I, you know, to me, it's this issue of um, to what degree is the relationship between she and and Madame Park going to be about more than just the show, right? You know, and the the positive energy. I mean, I agree with you. I hear nothing but positive impressions of her from Chinese I speak to as well. So I, I do think she has kind of a unique, you know, rock starish status in in China, which is interesting. Um, on on the SNED, you know, I think I, I'm waiting for the for the communique. I mean, you know, it's been very interesting to me. The run-up has been quite silent. I mean, you know, even even the journalism calls have been <laughs> rather quiet, and I think it's because nobody expects anything. Uh, you know, uh, my view is that I would recommend Jane Perlez's article this morning in the Times and Simon Denyer's of yesterday. Don't read the parts where I was quoted, but the rest of it is pretty good. <laughs> uh, and uh, and 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 so you know, just this idea that the relationship is indeed in a in a tricky spot totally resolvable, totally fixable. I think both sides are keen on, on doing that. SNED is a fantastic platform for doing that. You have these high level leaders from both sides coming together and kind of, especially with the president going for APEC in China, you know, this fall, it's a great opportunity to set the table uh, for that. So we'll see. I mean, I'm not expecting a lot in terms of deliverables simply because my impression is that the there wasn't even a, a viable agenda until days ago, you know, I mean, it just wasn't, I didn't feel the energy from prep this time that there may have been for previous rounds of the SNED. I also do think there's a, some perception, fairly or unfairly, on the Chinese side that, that the two U.S. interlocutors aren't quite as engaged as their predecessors were, just in terms of general interest, not that they don't see the forum as very important and, and, and so on and so on. I'm not sure that's a fair assessment, but I think it exists and therefore it has implications. Um, and so, you know, what I'm looking for coming out of it is what, how, how does the SNED reflect the preparations you know, for the summit between the two presidents uh, this fall, and will they announce things like a national security advice, uh, national security advisor Rice trip, you know, to Beijing to prepare to prepare for that, or or those kind of issues? We'll have to we'll have to see what happens. That's really, I mean, that's interesting because, um, right, you can't think of an ideal circumstance to really try to move the ball, mm -hmm. right? To have the SNED. Um, which in itself is a um, 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 the, the sort of action forcing event that uh -huh. should lead to some sort of um, progress on whatever the issues. But then to have the president going in the fall right mm -hmm. to Beijing, to have that one-two punch, 
It's important. You, it would, you would, that's really the right playing field for very high expectations Absolutely. or something. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, it, it would be kind of disappointing if nothing came out. No, of that's it. the worry, I think. Yeah. In other words, so is the relationship uh, stalled enough that we're missing the first, the, the, yeah. you know, the S&ED, as you point out, should be a springboard toward right. that. You know, yeah. you mentioned in your opening remarks about how summits are forcing function yeah. for the respective yeah. bureaucracies. So we should be seeing that yeah. kind of motion, but yeah. we're not. And I mean, I think that tells us that the relationship is in a tricky spot, you yeah. know, that needs some attention at the very senior levels from both sides. Yeah. Let me and let me just say on the on the what you, on what the countries can do to sort of effectuate eventually a summit between the leadership. You know, I think the interesting thing, um, one of the interesting things that the Pakane Xi Jinping summit has done, it, is that it has created uh, more. Um, attention to displaying to others that while Korea and Japan are having these history issues, they're still managing to move forward the working aspect of the relationship. That's a great point. So that, I, and I think it's in a way that we haven't heard them talk about before. So there's a lot more focus on, um, um, uh, on things like um, um, trilateral coordination on six party talks, there's um, uh, at the, the trilateral sort of military dialogues and defense dialogues. You know, the Seoul has been trying to make point these things are continuing to move forward in spite of the difficult history relationship, which, I mean, from an a American per policy perspective is music to your ears, right? Mm. Because that's, what you, that, that's always been the way the United States has been forced to manage this relationship, which is you can't expect that there's a golden key for the history problem, but you hope that the governments can continue to work pragmatically with this baseline of historical problems. I mean, we all have historical problems with different members of our family, but we managed to <laughs> move, we have that as a baseline, but we managed to sort of move forward pragmatically on other things. And, you know, and it is, that's the kind of relationship it is. Yeah, I think just too. related to that, uh, there's, I think there's, there's some similar vibrations going on in the China-Japan relationship. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, I, I just can't bring myself to say I'm optimistic about it. But, but, but you know, the METI minister did go and have a good visit, I think. He saw a uh, vice premier and Politburo member, not the right one. He should be seeing Wang Yang. He saw Liu Yandong. But, but at least the atmosphere was generally good. Right. There wasn't too much emphasis on, uh, on the, the history issue. And having just come from Tokyo, it, it's clear to me that they're feeling a little more optimistic. Uh, you know, China has a pattern of, of being the most shrill before they're ready to make a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we'll, we'll have to see if there's anything uh, further there. Let's go right here on the aisle. Uh, hi, Xiao Yang Xiao of Banghui Daily Shanghai, China. Uh, there were reports saying that one of the main topics uh, of this past, just past a visit with regard to China-South Korean economic cooperation is that China is asking the, the South Korea to join the proposed uh, Asian Infrastructure Development Bank, while there were also reports saying that the U.S. has been laying some pressure on South Korea to not join it. So my question is, how does U.S. view uh, view this investment bank and will this initiative consist sort of a challenge to the U.S. influence in the region? And what if uh, South Korea made a make a decision to join it? Uh, will this sour the bilateral relations between U.S. and South Korea? Thank you very much. You want to I'll take a stab, yeah. sure. Uh, you know, my sense is that on the on the first order question of of you know how does the U.S. side see the the bank? I think it's something we're watching very carefully. I think it's fair to say that um, you know China deserves some credit, frankly, for for seeing that need right that's there in terms of interest infrastructure development in Southeast Asia and jumping on it. What's interesting to me is that, uh, and I, I'm guessing that South Korea probably has the same approach, which is why we didn't see any strong statement from them saying, yes, we're in, uh, is that while the Southeast Asian countries, for example, are very desirous of having the, the aid, the, uh, the infrastructure development aid, um, post the Nine Dash Line and, and recent other developments and so on, there is some underlying skepticism, right, uh, about does this come with strings attached or what else 
is in this. And so I think there's a strong desire for China to try to bring in others, right, uh, into that process so that it doesn't look like it's just them, uh, you know, doing the, doing the financing. And I would think Seoul then's reaction might be, you know, we're not close to the idea, but let's see how you and the other players choose to capitalize this particular <laughs> enterprise. And based on that, we'll think about how we might want to participate or not. So I think they're probably waiting, would, would, would be my guess. Um, as to, uh, you know, whether the U.S. sees it as, you know, a, a danger or, you know, something like that, I don't think so. I mean, you know, my feeling is this requires a little bit of nuance to understand what the Chinese are doing. And I'm guessing, I admit I don't know, but, but you know, my, my view is things like the BRICS Bank, things like AIIB are not designed to undermine the post-World War II Bretton Woods, you know, system and so on, uh, but rather to establish some parallel structures where China sees it in its interest to be able to operate to achieve other, other goals. And, you know, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about the Asia for Asians comment and, and things like this. My own view is it's been slightly misinterpreted. I don't quite, I don't quite see it as as menacing as it has been, you know, portrayed in a in, in a few contexts. But we will have to watch that space very closely to see again. Do these are they indeed just simply parallel financing institutions to drive Chinese economic growth, or are there broader strategic implications and goals associated with them? And time will tell on that. Uh, yeah, right there. Uh, Gil Rosman, the Asan Forum. Uh, we haven't heard anything about Putin's initiatives to North Korea <laughs> and appeals to South Korea to join in <laughs> and China's response and whether the Sino-Russian new level of cooperation extends to the Korean Peninsula or that's turning again, that's working against their cooperation. Could someone comment on that, Chris? Sure. Uh, uh, why don't you start on the North Korea piece oh, okay. and then I'll All right. hop in. So, um, well, and Gil, you know this as well as anybody else. I mean, I think, so, you know, um, there certainly are tactical reasons why we see this outreach to North Korea on the part of the Russians. But a lot of it has to do with Putin himself, right? I mean, Putin is the only Russian leader in recent history that has, any, has had any interest in North Korea, you know, whether this is the last time he was in office or this time in office, there's a demonstrated record there of being interested, in, you know, in North Korea and um, in trying to try uh, to befriend the leadership, try to do things in an unorthodox way that makes the leadership feel comfortable. This famous offer to visit his apartment, Kim, you know, for Kim Jong Il to visit his apartment and have lunch off the summit schedule, you know, I guess not many leaders do that for the North Korean leader. So, you know, these sorts of things are really appreciated. You know, in the broader scheme of things, yes, you know, there's this idea of this energy infrastructure that you could build. It's not so much the North Koreans would benefit from this in energy, which you wouldn't need much of for them to benefit, but it's really the rents that they would get if this structure moved through all of Asia and connected, you know, connected uh, um, Russia's energy infrastructure to the economies of Asia. So I think that's always been the grand plan. Um, the Russians were always also interested during six-party talks in providing light water reactors to the North Koreans, much to our dismay. Um, um, and so there's always been that element of it, but, um, and they've forgiven the debt, right, uh, or a large part of the debt. But I think the, 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 the historical problem, and I think it still is the current problem, is that you know, there are a couple of steps that they take, but it never really rolls out into an implementable strategy. Um, and I think that's the same challenge that they face, they face this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I largely agree with that. I guess one thing that's interesting to me about it, I see some parallels between that side of the house and what's happening between Russia and China and Central Asia, right? And, and I think that, uh, you know, what was interesting about the Xi-Putin summit was, you know, if you, it depends on your frame of analysis. If you want to emphasize 
the, the sort of lim the hard limits in what can be achieved in the relationship, then Central Asia sort of seems to me like uh, an issue where they both decided, well, we'll just lay that aside. You know, yeah, sooner or later there'll be a great game element to this, but you know, let's just stay focused on the cooperative pieces. Um, and I think perhaps there's some of that going on in the North Korea relationship. The other way to look at it is that the two of them have reached a much deeper uh, strategic sort of common uh, viewpoint in which should there be issues in either Central Asia or North Korea or elsewhere, they've agreed to, to have a way to manage it bilaterally, to work cooperatively. And I, I think the jury's out on what the answer is. Uh, my, my suspicions run toward the latter, but, uh, uh, but I think that's something we should all watch very closely. So thanks for answering, asking that question. I think it's an important one. Why don't we take a, a group, just a couple, we'll do one here and then these two on the aisle. Right here. Ah, right. <laughs> Hi, Bill Tucker. Uh, I'd like for you to comment on uh, on China reaching out to to South Korea and Japan, while at the same time being more assertive in the South China Sea and protecting uh, what they think is their interest in these in these islands there. Okay. Oh, great. Right. We're taking a group. Yeah, we're taking a group. Yeah. We'll take a couple. Yeah. Take a couple. Okay. Just two right. more, and then he's on the aisle. Lee from KBS. Uh, I'm very curious about the next step or next move by China on North Korea side. The, do you think it is possible for uh, President, President Xi Jinping will meet the uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in the near future or uh, President Xi Jinping will make a high-ranking official to visit uh, North Korea? Okay. Okay, and then last one. Uh, Yong Chen Kim from Fletcher School. Uh, can you elaborate more about your statement that the South Korea and uh, China relationship is about North Korea this time? Because if you look at the official statement, not only Japan but also North Korea was not mentioned in the official statement. They only talk about nuclear denuclearization in Korean Peninsula. They didn't specify North Korea. So what do you think about this? I'll start. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not sure that the, the moves the Chinese are making with Japan and Korea are necessarily related to what's going on in the South China Sea. I mean, I think this is another one of the myths or, or narratives that has been true for so long, but named, that Xi Jinping may now be shattering, which is this idea that they don't want to have multiple fires burning at once. Um, and so they got to stabilize in Northeast Asia to be busy in Southeast Asia. You know, my own sense is that he sees all of this as part of a, a net, not individual issues. And, and so to me, it's, Coincidence at, at, at best, I, and, and especially in, in, in a Xi Park summit, there really is no East China Sea or South China Sea angle there. I don't think the South Koreans want to touch that with a hundred foot pole. Uh, so you know, I, I just don't see it in, in answer to that question. Uh, I think there was one about will Xi Jinping go or, or, or what's going on. I have seen no indication that, that there's any interest on the Chinese side in, in either hosting Kim Jong-un right now or uh, in the Chinese sending uh, either Xi himself or some sort of senior leader. I mean, this has been very interesting. I mean, it, it's, it's a major, again, I, you know, I just mentioned breaks with past practice. This is another major break with, with past practice. Xi Jinping is very comfortable with unsettling others, you know, <laughs> and risk and, and so on. And, and so I think he's trying to send a very deliberate message there. And I think, you know, if you're Beijing too, there's an awful lot of concern, as Victor mentioned earlier, we may be going back into the traditional, you know, bad, bad guy cycle. And so why would the Chinese want to host Kim Jong-un and then have him go back and do something that you know, causes them to lose face. So I, I don't see it. Maybe you do from yeah, the North no, Korean side. <laughs> no, no, no. I think I'm so, you know, one of the things we do is we, we collect all this data and we've looked at sort of the correlation between um, China South Korea meeting, high level China South Korea meetings and high level China North Korea meetings. And I can't remember, maybe this, our, my set, I can't remember the exact, but they're fairly closely correlated, like within a period of weeks. Generally, you see over time, if they do one, they do the other. And it's part of their whole equidistance policy. And what's striking now is this, you know, really nothing, right? 
So um, in answer to the question, you know, I think there's a better chance of Abe <laughs> going to North Korea than, than, there is a, than there is a chance of Xi Jinping. And then, uh, and then, and then, and then on the, uh, on the uh, right, there's a better chance of Abe going to North Korea than there is of Abe going to South Korea. And then, and then on the, um, the, you know, the, the non-mention of North Korea in the statement, I mean, so this is part, you're, you're a student, right? So this, so this is part of international relations and diplomacy. It's like the more they don't talk about it formally, the more they actually talked about it, <laughs> right? So, uh, um, so, and I think in this case, you know, what, you know, it's, again, it's about messaging. And the main message they wanted to send is that they're both in favor of denuclearization of the peninsula, right? Obvi obviously, that's what they're concerned about. And, you know, for the, for the Chinese, there are, certain equities they have with North Korea that would be badly damaged if they were very clearly out there and said, yeah, we went, we dissed North Korea and we want to put that in our joint statement. So, you know, that's, that's, if you think about it, there's no positive gain from that because everybody knows that's what they did. Mm. And there's only loss because if anything, it could just push the North Koreans off in bad directions. Mm. So I think that's why you don't see it. But I think everybody believes, of course, that this, you know, this was the elephant in the room, right? Yeah, and that, yeah. how could you not talk about it? Um, mm -hmm. I think with that, we've, we've reached our time. Again, thank you all for coming to CSIS. This event recording and audio will be available on the CSIS website. Thanks again. Please thank our speakers. Well done. Yeah,